Hello children, this is Grandma Carla with Freddy Goes Camping by Walter R. Brooks. And we are on chapter 17. Freddy hadn't wanted Mrs. Minerva to go camping with them. He thought it would be a bother to have to keep feeding her compliments all day long so that she wouldn't be cranky. And he had an idea she might be bossy. But as a matter of fact, she was no trouble at all. She not only did her full share of work, but she turned out to be good company. Some people are like that. In a different setting, they are different people. Of course, he and Kempfer kept up the compliments. They weren't taking any chances. But though Miss Minerva was an experienced woodsman and even went out of her out with her hatchet and built and roofed her own lean-to shelter, she had what Freddie thought were pretty silly ideas about fixing things up. She decorated the camp. She had brought along a lot of ribbons and doodads, and she put little frills and bows on everything. There was a little red bow on the frying pan and big splashy pink bows on the canoe paddles, and she even had Jinx wearing a very fancy plaid bow around his neck. Mr. Kampfer said, that's what they call the feminine touch. He smiled at the cat. Makes you look quite chic and charming, said Jinx, quite one of the 10 best dressed cats of the social season. Ah, choke it off, will you, said Jinx. If she wasn't so handy with a hatchet, do you think I'd let her make a monkey out of me like this? Yeah, I think you would, said Freddy. Or was it some other cat I saw a little while ago admiring himself in Mr. Kampfer's shaving mirror? Jinx stalked off angrily, but he didn't take off the bow. The first night, Freddy put the cart carton containing the bug volunteers in the shelter where he and Mr. Kampfer slept, or rather, where they tried to sleep, for the crickets sang and chirped and sawed away on their fiddles all night long. Mr. Kampfer sat up finally and lit the candle. Are you awake, Freddy? He said. Well, what do you think? said the pig, sitting up too. I think we've got to do something about this. Good heavens, don't those creatures ever go to bed? I don't know much about the sleeping habits of bugs, Freddy said. Let's talk to Mr. Webb. He took the cover off the carton, and Mr. Webb climbed out and crawled into his ear, but not so far that it would tickle. And he said, I'm sorry about this, Freddy. We've tried every way that we know to keep them quiet, even threatened to eat them. Mother's about frantic. She tied up a couple of them so they couldn't fiddle, but the others just cut them loose. But what's it all about, Freddy asked. Sort of a patriotic rally, I gather. One of them started singing the night before the battle, Mother, and they all chimed in, and now they're singing the bean marching song. Sounds like just a lot of chirping to me. Sure, to me too. Modern stuff, I guess. Why don't you souse them in the lake? Well, said Freddy, I had you hire the noisiest bugs I could think of for this job. I oughtn't to kick it if they do what I expected them to do. I'll take the carton down and leave it under the canoe. So he did and slept like a top the rest of the night. Freddy had a good time in the next two days. It was fun camping. They explored the woods and the lake and he practiced paddling and found every hour of the day packed with a dozen new things to learn and interesting things to do. Of course, the main reason he enjoyed it so much was because he had a comfortable place to sleep at night. Lots of inexperienced campers come back from a trip, red-eyed and worn out from lack of sleep, and looking as if they had been dragged backwards through a briar patch. Freddy was lucky in having Mr. Camper to show him the right way to do things at the start. The second day, they went down to Lakeside and looked around. Carpenters were repairing the porch, and Gormley's, the plumber's, the, tr the plumber's truck, was parked beside the road. A woman was shaking a dust mop from an upper window. They went back to camp without asking any questions. But the following morning at breakfast, they heard someone coming down the trail, and Jinx and Georgie and Charles disappeared into the bushes as Mr. Anderson appeared. He walked up to them. Good morning, Mr. Campfer, isn't it? I'm Anderson. Then he looked at Freddy, who no longer wore his disguise. 
Haven't I seen you before? Very likely, said Freddy. I'm around Cinnaboro a lot. And he thought, he knows I'm after him, but he isn't sure whether or not I know he's Mr. Aha. This is Freddy, the well-known detective, said Mr. Camphor, and my aunt, Miss Minerva Camphor. Mr. Anderson bowed, but turned again to Freddy. The detective, he said, oh yes, must be interesting work following people and peeking through keyholes and listening behind doors. Though I wouldn't care for such sneaky work myself. He laughed with false heartiness. He tr he's trying to make me mad, so I'll give myself away, Freddy thought. But two could play at that game. He said calmly, I doubt if you'd be much good at it. You're a pretty big man. You'd be always tripping and falling over things, he grinned at Mr. Anderson. You probably lose your temper pretty easily too, don't you? Mr. Anderson's face got darker red and he glared, breathing hard through his nose. But Mr. Camper said, sit down, sit down and have a flapjack. You'll like them, I think, if you've never tried one of my flapjacks. Freddie thought for a minute that Mr. Anderson was going to burst into small pieces for the ghost, of course, had not only tried one of Mr. Camper's flapjacks, he had wrestled with one, but he controlled himself. Evidently, he felt certain that they did not know that he was a ha. Thank you, he growled and, came and sat down. Freddy noted with pleasure that he sat down very slowly and carefully on account of birdshot. I understand, said Miss Minerva, that you bought Lakeside. My sister and I spent many summers there. What has become of dear Mrs. Fillmore? Mr. Anderson had managed to choke back his rage. A great pity, he said. She couldn't make a go of it. I didn't buy it myself, though. I'm merely acting for a group of New York capitalists, getting it in shape to open. Next month, we hope. I trust that you and your sister will stay with us again. We plan to, said Miss Minerva with an odd smile, though I suppose you won't be there. Oh, yes, I moved up last night. I shall be there from now on. He ate several flapjacks, and they talked of this and that. Freddy didn't needle him anymore, and after a while, he got up and went back to Lakeside. He didn't find out much, said Mr. Camper, but we didn't accomplish anything either. Oh, yes, we did, said Freddy. The webs are riding back to the hotel on his coat collar. Now we've got spies right in the enemy's camp. The day was spent in planning and preparation, and that evening, as soon as it got dark, Freddy left, left Mr. Camphor and Miss Minerva beside the campfire and moved his forces up. With jink scouting in advance, they carried the box containing the bug allies up the trail as far as the edge of the lakeside lawn. From there, the bugs proceeded on foot under the leadership of the head cricket up to the porch where Mr. and Mrs. Webb were to take charge. Homer and the four mice went with them, but the others stayed back among the trees. The carpenters and plumbers had gone home at five o'clock, but Mr. Anderson's car stood on the lawn with another old car beside it. There were lights in two of the upper hotel windows. Nothing happened for a while, and then Freddie saw a very faint and tiny glow of light coming towards him through the grass. It didn't come in a straight line, but wavered from side to side, and as it came closer, he saw that it was Homer with a firefly on his head to light the way. Beside the firefly stood a spider, and Freddie could see that they were hanging on by a strand of web that was looped like a bridle around the snake's neck. Boy, was that firefly a good idea, Freddy, said Homer. Just like having headlights, I can travel twice as fast at night. Well, you'll travel without me next time, said Mrs. Webb tartly, and climbed shakily up on Freddy's nose. If anyone ever invites you to go snakeback riding, Freddy, you just politely excuse yourself. That canoe ride over here was bad enough, but this was ten times worse. Why, any mortal creature can't go from one place to another in a straight line instead of dodging and zigzagging all over creation beats me. 
Now, now, Mother Webb, said Homer. Lots of folks pay good money to get a ride like that on roller coasters at amusement parks. He glided over to Georgie and began teasing him with baby talk. Mrs. Webb snorted. It was a pretty small snort, of course, but very expressive. And then she gave Freddie her report. Mr. Anderson was not alone in the hotel. He had brought a couple named Jones up from Centerboro to help get the place in shape and rather later to act as handyman and housekeeper. The old car was theirs and they had the lighted room in the back. Mr. Anderson's was the front one. Mr. Webb is getting the crickets place now, she said, in cracks and keyholes and safe places where they can't be caught. They'll start in as soon as the lights are out. That's all you're going to do tonight, isn't it? That ought to be enough for Anderson for tonight, Freddie said. We just want to wear him down by keeping him awake. But those Joneses, can anybody else get into their room? The mice were going to gnaw holes in both rooms so that we could all get in and out easily. They'd better do that tomorrow in the daytime when nobody will hear them, said Freddie. We'll just try crickets tonight to see how it works. Homer had better go back and help keep an eye on things. But since that ride over here made you seasick, you might as well stay here. No, no, I'll go back, said the spider. I don't like to leave father alone. He's right in Anderson's room under the bed, and he's got one or two ideas I'd just as soon he didn't try out. You know how daring he is. He'll be more careful if I'm there. So pretty soon, she and the firefly got on Homer's head and started out. After a few minutes, the light in the Joneses' room went out, and then Mr. Anderson's window was put up. They saw him lean out and look out at the night. Then he disappeared, and his light went out too. And immediately, through the stillness, came the chirp of a cricket. Another joined in and then another, until pretty soon the whole night seemed to be full of their singing. Golly, said Freddie in an odd tone, I bet you can hear them halfway across the lake. After about five minutes of it, the lights went on again in both rooms, and every sound was cut off short. Shadows moved across the lights, and Mr. Anderson's window went down with a bang. The lights went out, and the crickets started fiddling. Four times this happened, and each time the lights were left on longer. They're trying to find the crickets, Freddie said. I hope Webb found safe places for them. You know what Anderson will do if he finds one. I know what I'd do, said Georgie. Remember how we yelled under old Witherspoon's window that night to keep him awake, said Jinx? That's what gave me the idea, Freddie said. Only we've got to do a lot more to Anderson before we get through. We've got to make him mad. We've got to make him so mad he'll begin doing foolish things, and then we'll have him. You mean, said Charles, that that's the only idea you've got for getting rid of him? Sure, said Freddy. Why? Well, it's the silliest thing I ever heard of, said the rooster. Is it? Remember the time you got so mad at a truck driver for calling you a chicken that you'd have let him run over you before you'd get out of the road? Pooh. It isn't the same thing at all, said Charles. All right, you wait and see. Hey, there go the lights again. Hear them banging around? They're getting pretty mad already. There had been several thumps and a crash in Mr. Anderson's room, followed by a lot of bad language. At least it sounded like the worst kind of language, though they couldn't hear the words. Then things quieted down, but the lights were left on. Of course, crickets are annoyed by sudden light and prefer to sing in the dark, but these crickets had their orders, and after a minute, reali realizing that the lights weren't going to be put out again, the full chorus started up again. I can't stand this, said Georgie. I guess I've got a sympathetic nature. I keep thinking what it's like for that poor man in there until I'm just about as nervous as he is. I'm going back to camp. I suppose we might as well all go back and get some sleep, said Freddy. Webb will keep things rolling until daylight, and Homer and the mice will be there. Well, my nature's not sympathetic, Jinx said, and I wouldn't miss this for eight pounds of prime catnip. If the guy goes crazy, I want to be here to see it. Go on, I'll keep an eye on things. Miss Minerva and Mr. Camper were rolled up in their sleeping bags and the fire had burned down. Mr. Camper wasn't snoring. Thoughtful of his aunt, even in his sleep, Freddie said to himself. 
He crawled into his lean-to and was asleep again in two minutes. When he awoke, it was broad daylight and the campers were getting breakfast. Jinx strolled up as Freddy came out from his plunge in the lake. Boy, did you miss a show, he said. Those crickets sure can keep up the chatter. They ought to be in Congress. Old Anderson never slept a wink, and finally, about an hour before daylight, he really cut loose. He yelled and smashed things. I bet there isn't a whole stick of furniture left in that room. How about the Joneses? They quit about three, piled in their car after a yelling match with the boss. Boy, has that Mrs. Jones got a rough time. She filed Anderson down to about three inches high. Finally, he said he'd get some DDT and spray the place in the morning. But they said he could put it in the bathtub and drown himself in it if he wanted to. They were through. And off they went. DDT, said Freddy. I don't like that. Spiders don't mind it. But I don't know about crickets. We'll have to give that a little thought. I've arranged to get hourly reports of what goes on from the mice, Jinx said. One of them, or Homer, will meet us will meet one of us every hour on the hour under that big beach at the edge of the hotel lawn. Right now, Brother Anderson is making up a little of his lost sleep on a settee in the lounge. We can't have that, said Freddie. What's the matter with the crickets? They knocked off at 6.30, said they'd only work an eight-hour night. My goodness, Freddie said. This is a war. They're not working in a factory. Yeah, Webb had an argument with them about that. They claim it's the same as an, any orchestra, and they're working under musicians' union rules. You'd better let them alone, or you'll have a strike on your hands. Anyway, Webb's there. I don't guess Anderson will get much sleep. What can Mr. Webb do? What can he do? Jinx exclaimed. Say, you ought to see it. Why don't you go pay Anderson a little call? Just go to the door of the lounge and look in. You can make some excuse. Tell him that you want to borrow a cup of flour or something. Come on, it's worth it. Freddy hesitated, but he didn't think that Mr. Anderson would dare do anything more than possibly order him out, so he and Jinx walked down to the hotel. They went quietly up on the porch, looked into the lounge. Mr. Anderson lay on his back on the settee, asleep with his mouth open. Freddy looked inquiringly at Jinx and the cat pointed up at the ceiling where he saw two little black spots. Then they moved and he realized that they were the webs. As he watched, Mr. Webb spun down on a long strand directly above Mr. Anderson's face. Halfway down, he stopped and waved a couple of legs at Freddy and then went on and anchored the strand cautiously to the man's left ear. At the same time, Mrs. Webb ran a line down to his right ear and then between the two lines and just an inch or two above his face, they wove a web. They worked fast and when the web was finished, they ran swiftly up to the ceiling and cut the two lines loose so that the whole web dropped down across the sleeper's face. Mr. Anderson's nose wiggled, his eyelids twitched, and then as the web settled closer across his mouth, he woke with a sort of snarl and started up, clawing at his face. Good morning, said Freddy pleasantly. Mr. Anderson swung around, still brushing at the cobweb. You, he said, what are you doing here? Me, said Freddy, nothing. I was just taking a walk and I thought I'd drop in. Sorry if I woke you. I hope you slept well your first night in Lakeside. Three seconds later, the two animals were tearing up the trail toward camp, followed by the infuriated roars of Mr. Anderson and also by several stones, which whizzed and clipped through the foliage above them. I wonder what upset him so, said Freddy, when they slowed down out of range. I can't imagine, said Jinx. Maybe he didn't sleep well. And then they both burst out laughing. Just the same, said Jinx. You'd better not pull that one again. If he's that mad after one night, what'll he be in a week? That's what I want to find out, said Freddy. Okay, so now we're going to look at the pictures. And here is Mr. Jinx admiring his bow in the mirror. And this one says they explored the woods and the lake. There they all are exploring. And 
see if we got any more pictures. And that is the end of chapter 17. And this is Grandma Carla, and I love you.